Hi, Lee Veris here with Photoshop tips and techniques for teachers and students. Today's rant, and it's a bit more rant-like today, uh, is about the growing trend to dumb down imaging software with preset-driven user interfaces and the introduction of so-called artificial intelligence for image enhancements. Thankfully, Photoshop has mostly resisted the trend of dumbing down because the installed user base is so large and vocal. Nobody will approve of features or tools being removed in favor of ease of use. Modest improvements with intelligent selection and auto color mostly serve to supplement rather than replace features. Unfortunately, new uh, competing software has appeared that pursues a different strategy with an overabundance of presets, looks, and lookup tables wrapped up in automatic artificial intelligent enhancements. There's no historical precedence for this in the art world, except perhaps paint by numbers. Uh, for tens of thousands of years, the tools of art have been relatively simple. A modest collection of paintbrushes and paints allowed artists to create masterpieces of enduring splendor, limited only by the seemingly limitless imagination of the artist. Incredible creations made with simple tools evolving in surprising original works of art. Fast forward to today and the introduction of computers, artificial intelligence, and algorithmically generated art. This painting was authored by a computer program. And uh, I would argue that this is certainly not better than something a human artist could create. And what about this painting? This actually sold at auction for more money than an Andy Warhol painting. Really? WTF. Artificial intelligence applied to art creation has even showed up in the writing of screenplays. This film on YouTube is titled Sunspring, and it is hilariously, it hilariously makes no sense. Definitely worth, worth watching just to see how awful a computer program is at generating drama. The programmers fed their software with hundreds of sci-fi movies and TV and movie scripts, and the result seems more like statistically weighted snippets of text blended into grammatically correct sentences that mean nothing. So what does this mean for image enhancement software? How does artificial intelligence impact the photodigital artist? We're starting to see a growing trend of creative choice fueled by statistical analysis. The idea being that if we have enough examples to choose from, we can apply an image enhancement that delivers a good result. But, this, but does this really help? Does it help provide a context for image enhancement? Can you arrive at a creative solution via multiple choice? Does a large collection of presets help you? And what about special looks or lookup tables? Well, let's look at Preset Mania in some different imaging software, starting with Lightroom. Yes, Adobe is not completely immune from the temptations of presets, and presets actually can serve a useful function. Lightroom has one of the better implementations of presets, as we will see here. Now, before we uh, go into Lightroom, I just wanted to uh, do a little history lesson. Um, Adobe used to have a feature in Photoshop called variations, and we're, we're looking at a screenshot of it here. And this was a, an attempt to automate some color correction uh, for novice users, to make it easy for a novice user to apply some um, image enhancements um, through this feature called variations. So the, the current pick would be this um, your image would show up in the middle here as well as up in the uh, in the upper left corner here and along the right hand side you'd have the current pick and then variations that were lighter darker and here you can see more green more yellow more red more magenta more blue more cyan um, and what would happen is if you picked say the one that was more cyan it would pop into the middle and become the current pick and then it would all iterate again. So you could keep exploring uh, variations on the image this way and see sort of quickly updated uh, uh, color variants or exposure variants. You had some modest control over, you know, whether you were doing the shadows, midtones, highlights, uh, whether you were also going to variate 
uh, saturation and how fine or coarse the uh, adjustments would be. Now, this got abandoned when Adobe moved to the Creative Cloud and all their apps went into 64-bit mode only. So um, and that was sort of the excuse that they used to get rid of it. I know a lot of people liked it. I found it a complete waste of time. Uh, if you just kept perusing these variations, you could spend hours looking at things and trying to decide, was that better? Is this better? And all of these things could be easily replicated with simple curves. So um, there wasn't anything really extraordinary about uh, this. And we all kind of wondered whether Adobe would update this into a fancier version or not. And uh, basically, it has fallen by the wayside, and we no longer see these sort of things. However, the concept, I think, has now been replaced with this notion of presets. Uh, and we're going to look at that here um, in Lightroom, and I'll use this image here. So, um, all right, let's get back our... I'm going to get my uh, tabs back here. All right, so this is kind of like uh, what you would see in the interface. Um, and we can, of course, reduce the, uh, the strip at the bottom so we have more screen real estate. And uh, let's not look at, well, let's get out of our library tab and go right to the develop tab. And now you can see the presets show up here. And uh, Adobe, this actually, I have to say, I think Adobe's done a very good job at, at presenting the, the presets and allowing you some control over what piece presets you see. Um, these are, there's a whole bunch here that, that basically Adobe ships with Lightroom these different presets. And if you kind of scroll over the, uh, the names here, you'll see how the image updates. It looks, it changes its look based on what uh, preset uh, you're selecting. And um, I mean, some of these actually are a little odd. If we like, you know, here's a, if I pick this cool light one, what it does is it actually changes uh, what Adobe calls the profile, which is just a lookup table. And uh, this is an interesting thing because uh, this is fairly new. They have a profile browser now in Lightroom. And if I'll undo this and go back to my previous one, i would made some adjustments uh, based off of the initial profile of this camera Astia Soft. This is a Fuji uh, film camera and um, uh, Fuji has some in-camera um, JPEG renderings that it calls film simulations, and Astia Soft is one of the film simulations. So Adobe has created a profile that's loadable in Lightroom that emulates the in-camera JPEG rendering uh, for the Astia film simulation. Um, so you can browse all the profiles that are available for this camera by clicking on this little uh, grid icon here. And now we can see all these um, different thumbnails which represent the available uh, profiles. So uh, you can see first here are my favorites. I'll get into that in a minute. The default ones are here for Adobe Raw. This is the Adobe Color, Adobe Monochrome, Landscape, Portrait, all of these things do slightly different things. You can kind of see the image gets updated. Um, and then there's the camera matching ones. And you can see that I've starred some of these. Um, these are kind of my favorite in-camera uh, renderings. And the starred ones, if we just pick a star, like, uh, you know, I have this one is starred. But let's say I wanted to star the green one. If I just click on that that now becomes starred and those stars show up in my favorites up here. So um, see, there's the one I just starred. So you have a way of kind of organizing and adding to or subtracting from uh, these camera profiles that you would see. So once I've finished browsing through all of these, um, these uh, profiles, I can close that and now the ones that I've starred are the ones that show up here. 
Okay, so the Adobe is giving you some control over the profiles, and these are lookup tables. So it, very logically, they've placed this at the very top of your sort of adjustments, uh, available adjustments here, because this is a lookup table that renders the colors in the image before you've adjusted uh, any of the settings. So uh, if I zero everything out, this is using the, and we'll use as shot as the uh, color balance. Uh, this camera profile is generating this kind of color rendering just uh, based on the white balance as shot in the camera. And then everything that I do after that is me altering the way that would look. So I can open up the shadows, you know, maybe add a little clarity, you know, that kind of thing. Here I, I've, I've reduced the saturation just a little bit. So the profile is, is usually considered kind of a starting place. And most of the camera, most of the profiles available here in Lightroom are not uh, particularly wacky. Uh, however, they, when you load a preset, occasionally you can get a kind of an oddball um, lookup table being applied. So if I, I went again back to this cool light thing, we have this artistic uh, profile uh, which is being applied and uh, those are under this section in the profiles here right so um, these presets can control any of the slider settings or how what profiles are applied i'm going to un undo that um, and uh, I, I what i find of course if you just go through all of these this is like a rabbit hole that you can go down and, and spend hours again it's sort of like the variations where you just keep clicking on things and it makes these radical changes so someone that just isn't uh, comfortable making the adjustments themselves they can just pick something and uh, look at it and decide that it's it's cool and, and be done with it um, but it is kind of a rabbit hole. I mean, you spend hours looking at these things and trying to decide if that looks better than this. Um, I really want to avoid that. And I, what I think presets are the main functionality of presets is for something specific that the user wants to do. And I can see these general categories here. Uh, in this area are categories that I've added. So, uh, and here's also user presets is a, is a category that Adobe gives you that you can place any kind of um, preset look you want in here. I have one here called DSAT uh, Shadows that, uh, that I like to use. And this is something that I crafted myself um, and I want to use it again and again. So I just place it in here and I can just click on it and it will do that one thing that I do to desat the, the shadows. Okay, so again, these things are things that I've created. So how do you create uh, a preset? So let's just assume now uh, that I want to create a preset that um, has all of these slider settings and makes the image a lot cooler, right? So I would come up here and create a preset. Now I can I can name this preset. I can create a new uh, a new user group. So I'm going to call this test just so we can see here, um, and we'll call this you know cooling or something, right? And I can decide that I'm going to use uh, this treatment and profile that. Uh, the color settings and the basic tone settings are all going to be incorporated into this preset. I don't have to check any of the other things. So then I click on create and there's my new category that I've created myself with this preset in it. So um, again, I'll undo that and uh, um, we'll undo again. So um, now, the other thing, besides creating presets, Adobe's given you the ability to actually manage the existing presets. So we'll go in here, and this is a really nice thing because it allows me to turn off all of those stupid presets that I never want to look at ever. You know, like all of these are these Adobe ones. 
that I don't care about. Uh, I only care about my categories that I've created. So I'm just going to save this set. Of, all of those are still available. I can turn them back on. But right now, when I turn them off, I only see these. And I can look at my the categories that I want to use and find something uh, that creates this rendering of the image. So all in all, very well presented. The interface, of course, is that classic uh, Lightroom interface that we love. It's very clean and uh, nothing really gets in the way. We can view the image big, pick our presets, uh, uh, and look at the history, et cetera, all these kind of things. And uh, we can step back to the, uh, any place we were in the past. All right, so this is a very good, what I would consider a good implementation of presets. You can turn things off. It's not a feature unless you can turn it off. And uh, so we, we can use the presets or not use them. We can see exactly the kind of presets that we want to see. All right, so let's look at uh, another application. Um, we'll look at alien skin exposure because this one is, um, it's, in a way, it's the most similar to Lightroom. And I've, I've got it already set up here, and I'm in the edit mode. And um, there are a few differences. There are way more uh, presets. Uh, in fact, if we look at all of them, it just scrolls off the bottom of the, uh, the screen here. These are, and there's quite a few in here, lots and lots. So the rabbit hole is even deeper if you decide to pursue all this. Um, Alien Skin is giving you some interesting ways of organizing it. We can look at presets that are just color, uh, just black and white, our favorites, right? So um, again, a similarly, uh, if you star them, it becomes a favorite. And then when you just click on favorites here, those are the only ones that you see. Um, so kind of similar, there's user presets. I haven't created any user ones, but I do have uh, favorites. They don't make a way of like really limiting everything, uh, things that you'd never want to see, but they do give you a method of, uh, of kind of trimming down all the presets that you might uh, have to look at. So that's, that's a really good feature. Now, over here, uh, they have lookup tables as well, and, and some of the presets will change the lookup table. Now, the lookup table here is something that you can load in separately as part of your adjustment routine. Uh, kind of perhaps non-intuitively, they place the lookup table down here um, where it should really kind of be up above because I always feel like the, the lookup table, whatever you're using, uh, is sort of a rendering that has no controls over it. So it's either there or it's not. Um, Alien Skin does give you a way of, of adjusting the intensity of the lookup table. So if we picked something, and uh, I've loaded in some of these uh, um, sort of film looks uh, here, um, you can pick one of these and and then change the intensity. So we can dial it back if we don't feel like, you know, you can take it almost to zero if you want, uh, or you blend in how much of that you, you want to use. Um, so that's kind of an interesting feature. And then we can always go back to none and get back where we started. Um, so, you know, a decent implementation of lookup tables, although I, I really kind of think it needs to be up here so you conceptually you understand that it's something that's happening before you're um, uh, using your slider adjustments. But all in all, this is a, a reasonable implementation. Um, the lookup tables that Alien Skin supports, in fact, if we want to, we can kind of import uh, some lookup tables. And I can go right into Adobe's folder here. Uh, and look at the 3D lookup tables that, that Adobe supports. And here are these ones that are um, the Adobe Cube um, profiles. Um, these are lookup tables, and uh, Alien Skin supports this .cube uh, lookup table, but it does not 
support the sort of industry standard 3D lookup table. So these you can you can see uh, you can get these all over the internet. They're available almost everywhere, and some of them are useful in um, video editing or video uh, software, where you would apply a lookup table to create a, a certain look. And Adobe supports that now in an adjustment um, layer that that is a lookup table adjustment. So. Um, Although you can't pick these for alien skin, you can pick these cube ones. And so it's, it has some uh, utility beyond what is available just inside of exposure. Okay, so we're not going to do that, but I just wanted to point that out. Now, let's move on to uh, what I would consider a more problematic uh, presentation of presets, and that is in Luminar. So here's Luminar. And... Uh, as soon as we click on the edit uh, tab, we're in this kind of um, editing uh, uh, interface. Um, unfortunately, Luminar kind of, you know, the, the, the presets are kind of all down here along the bottom. And they, Luminar calls these looks. And you have a couple of different ones that ship with a program. Whenever you change... Uh, any of the uh, sort of categories of looks, it changes these thumbnails along the bottom, which all generate different uh, looking things. So if I scroll over it, it doesn't update the image. I have to actually click on it to update uh, the look of the image. And then again, like Alien Skin, they give you a method of kind of blending it back with the previous uh, look. So if you just want a little bit of this particular look, you can do that. Um, I'm going to undo this and uh, undo it again, and we'll go back to our, my default here. Um, so there are favorites. You can pick favorites, and you can create your own looks. Um, the essentials is kind of the default, and it's up here uh, every time you go into um, Luminar. Uh, you're going to see this. So, so now I've I've kind of inadvertently clicked on something and it's giving me a black and white look. So I'm going to undo that. Oh, here we go. There's my, <laughs> this was a, this was a black and white JPEG. So there's back, I'm back into my color image. And um, Luminar has this one, the AI image enhancer. This is something that utilizes a tool, um, this AI accent filter, they call it. So, the AI accent is a kind of an automatic adjustment that we can apply to the image and it's doing something. It's not clear exactly what it's doing, but it it is uh, uh, applying some artificial intelligence enhancement, right? And you can dial it in or back. And essentially when I click on this, it will apply that AI accent. But one thing I want to point out here, here, we have along the right hand side there are the tools um, that they call filters and we have little workspaces you know we can have the quick and awesome workspace which only gives me a couple of uh, tools um, essentials and you can you can create your own workspace here um, you know let's just say I like the professional one because that is most of the tools that I would want to use in it and you can see quite a few here and Luminar is very interesting. It has some very interesting tools and very interesting methods of adjusting the image. And some of them I find quite, uh, quite interesting and quite useful. Um, but watch what happens when I click on a preset. So we'll, tr we'll do this AI image enhancer preset. So I click on it and it does what it does to the image. But actually what's happened is it's, I've, I've lost the professional workspace that I had set up before. So if I want to get back those tools, I can go back to my workspace. And well, now the preset goes away. So I got my tools back, but I lost my preset. So it's a little weird. Uh, it's kind of an odd way of setting up the interface. It's almost like they, they're, they're fighting you. Uh, you know, I, I may like this look, I may even like it at 100%, but I want to do something else to it. And if my tool is gone, the only way to get it 
back is to go back and add these things one at a time. So, you know, if I wanted to add, say, a dehaze thing in here, tool in here, if I wanted to add, add, oh, say, a soft focus thing or, uh, or any of these, you know, professional tools, right, I have to click on it one at a time. And now that becomes a custom workspace. And if I now want to adjust it, now I can use the tools that I had to add, right? Now the workaround here is if you if you like uh, this particular preset and you want the extra tools to continue editing, you have to add them all in here, all the ones that you like using, and then save that as a new look. So I'll call this test two because I've already got a test one. So um, I can save that, and now that becomes a new preset, but this preset now has all the tools that I want to use, you know, to work with. So kind of annoying way to work around something that which should be built into the program. Um, now let's go back. <laughs> it's easy to undo it. It's one thing. I can just go back to my, um, my uh, professional... Um, uh, workspace layout here. Um, now, there's also a, a lookup table um, area here, lookup table mapping, right? So we can choose lookup tables here in, uh, in Luminar, and they give you a whole bunch of them, you know, and most of them are kind of wacky. Uh, we can download new lookup tables. Um, if I go to this, it, it takes me to um, Luminar's website. And yeah, here it offers to buy it. Yes, well, let's just see. So here's the Luminar market space. And here are all these lookup tables, you know, that you can, uh, you can purchase. Now, interestingly enough, uh, Luminar also supports... Um, Let's look at this here. If I now uh, download new lookup table files or load custom look here, we'll do this. We'll load custom lookup tables. And I can now uh, go back into that Photoshop lookup tables here. And uh, Luminar supports all of these cube ones. All, any of the anything that you can load in Photoshop, Luminar supports. So we can get these 3D lookup tables here uh, and open them up and add them into the mix. So now you can see now I have that option now that I've uh, I've loaded it. Um, so they they give you more possibilities for lookup tables but again all this stuff it's like again a super rabbit hole that you can go down and uh, it completely re renders the image in in often kind of strange ways uh, and sometimes useful ways but like I don't know why 1960s that's apparently the faded out lookup table um, anyway it's it's kind of messy uh, I mean, this this idea that they can load any lookup table they want in here is great, but uh, the way the interface uh, kind of doesn't support uh, an easy way of controlling the lookup tables is uh, is sort of annoying because of the what they do to the interface. They take away features when you want that to stay. Um, so, at any rate. You could spend hours and hours and hours with these lookup tables. I would suggest that it's better to spend hours learning how to use whatever tools are available, because most of these things, you know, if if um, go back, I think I can change this to none here. Let's see. Uh, no, once it's loaded in, I can't undo it. Um, so I have to change my, uh, uh, let's see, if I change to, say, the quick and awesome, it'll now throw away the adjustments that I <laughs> made. Again, kind of counterintuitively. 
And, uh, you know, perhaps I can go back here and pick something like, uh, you know, Portrait Enhancer or whatever. And I like that. Now a different set of tools come up. Again, really, really annoying. Anyway, um, I think that will stop here. There are lots of other programs that do this, and they throw these presets at you, and I kind of find them distracting and annoying more than helpful. But, uh, you know, perhaps it's, it's all part of the progress of image applications that they're going to do this to you. So we might as well get used to working with it. I would just like to be able to simplify the inter interface. I'd like to be able to get rid of this strip of, uh, of icons down here, the thumbnails. Um, and, uh, you know, because I'd like this image to be bigger when I'm working with this. I can't get this to go away. It's kind of annoying. So anyway, let's go back. So, preset mania. Well, the idea of presets is not all bad. A way to apply settings consistently according to the user's preferences isn't necessary for any kind of workflow efficiency. User presets can provide a good exam experience for people that want to apply similar adjustments routinely for their work. When presets become a required starting place for adjustments, it can open up a rabbit hole that becomes counterproductive. When we introduce lookup tables, the additional level of choice can be helpful or problematic, for example, when revisions become more difficult with attempts to undo something for which there is no fine-grained control. Again, any intelligent automatic adjustment, whether it's done through a preset or some variable algorithm, should support the user's creative options, not dictate them. So, be on the lookout for wacky looks and make sure you can fine-tune anything that, that a preset delivers, or it can be more trouble than it's worth. In the end, there's no replacement for knowledge of image enhancement techniques and experience in using image processing controls. This rant about preset mania is not a complete examination of the epidemic. There are other image processing applications that utilize a preset-driven interface, and even some that provide artificial intelligent driven enhancements with almost no user control over the effect. I will have to leave further explorations to future rants for the time being. Today's rant is finished. But I'm still looking at other image processing solutions outside the Adobe family of products. And I've seen some encouraging signs that it may be possible to live without Photoshop and Lightroom. Stay tuned to future Photoshop rants to see more and remember to get up from the computer and out into the real world every once in a while. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Photoshop Grant. You might be interested in more detailed information on my website, and you might consider following me on YouTube and Twitter to find out about my various classes and workshops. Be sure and like the video, and please subscribe to my YouTube channel. You might consider following me on Instagram, and I have two books in print available on Amazon in Kindle as well as paper versions, Mastering Exposure in the Zone System for Digital Photographers, and my bestseller, Skin, the Complete Guide to Digitally Lighting, Photographing, and Retouching Faces and Bodies. If you're looking for more in-depth Photoshop tutorials, I have a number of video courses available from my online school under the education menu at veras.com. And my latest Photoshop course is Complete Hair Masking, where I go into great detail on various old and new school techniques for creating great hair edge composites, including how to illustrate hair wisps using special brushes and stock photos of wigs, which I provide for download in the course. Thank you for watching. Post your questions and suggestions for topics to explore under the video, and I'll see you in the next Photoshop rant.